In the vast and varied landscape of the English language, there exists a hidden kingdom as wondrous as any found in the natural world. Here, amidst the lush foliage of words, dwell creatures of remarkable eloquence and persuasion. These are not birds as we know them, but beings of rhetoric, each with its own unique call and plumage. Today, we venture into this uncharted territory to observe them in their natural habitat. Join me as we explore some of the most powerful birds in the rhetorical kingdom. In this lesson, you can expect to explore three rhetorical devices. We'll look at antithesis, amplification, and anadiplosis with the help of some feathery friends. This unit so far has been about the art of rhetoric. This involves using language in such a way that it has an intended impact on the audience. If you wish to persuade, inspire, or motivate an audience, you need to be equipped with the tools of rhetoric, otherwise known as rhetorical devices. Rhetorical devices are specific ways of applying rhetoric in order to produce a desired effect. There are many different types of rhetorical devices, from simple repetition to connotative phrases and figures of speech. Here we have the antithesis bird. This fascinating creature's use of antithesis leaves the audience with a memorable, impactful phrase. Antithesis is a device in which a pair of statements act as mirror images. The second statement is a reversal of the first. Their grammatical structures remain similar, but by contrasting the two statements, an author or speaker is able to create emphasis and engage the audience. Let's take a closer look at the antithesis bird in action. Keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. Ooh, that's a little ominous for a bird. The juxtaposition of friends and enemies helps make this statement stay with the audience. This contrast is a hallmark of antithesis. It's also easy to remember and repeat, which can give a phrase more impact. A famous example of this comes from Patrick Henry's 1775 speech to the Virginia Convention. Give me liberty or give me death. What type of impact does this phrase have on an audience? The drastic difference between these two concepts imparts a sense of urgency and action to the crowd. Used sparingly, antithesis is a powerful tool of rhetoric. I wonder what other powerful techniques the rhetorical kingdom has to offer. Ah, yes, we are joined by none other than the amplification bird. Don't let its size fool you. This tiny titan packs quite the punch, with words, of course. They repeat examples of amplification from famous speeches in history. Amplification is the expansion of a statement. When used effectively, amplification intensifies a point the speaker wishes to prioritize and stimulates an emotional response from the audience. Let's see how the amplification bird uses words to amplify its point. This one repeats an excerpt from President Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. President Lincoln starts with a straightforward idea. They gather to dedicate a part of the field as a final resting place for the soldiers who died in battle. Then Lincoln takes this idea and expands on it in a powerful way. He suggests that in a bigger sense, they can't really dedicate the ground any more than it already is. Why? 
Because the brave soldiers who died fighting there have already made the ground sacred with their courage and sacrifice. Their actions have given the ground a significance that goes beyond what any words or ceremonies could add. The amplification serves to deepen the audience's understanding of the sacrifice made and to stimulate a more profound emotional response to the idea of national unity and the cost of freedom. Sometimes writers or speakers repeat the same point using different words. Sometimes they repeat a word or phrase in multiple contexts. The goal of amplification is not to be redundant, but instead to emphasize an important idea by adding layers of meaning. I think we have just one more incredible bird to discover today. Let's take a look. And here we have the common chicken. Um, those are just chickens. We've definitely seen those before. Can we please look at something a little more interesting? Ah, here we are. That's much better. This is the Anadiplosis bird. This one is really special. It uses a repetitive rhetorical device to call to other birds. Now, anadiplosis is a device that takes a word or words from the latter portion of a phrase or clause and repeats them near the beginning of the subsequent phrase or clause. Anadiplosis is a form of repetition that creates rhythm and emphasis. The word anadiplosis is derived from the Greek and can be translated as to be doubled back. Let's let our little friend show us an example from Shakespeare's Richard III. As you listen, notice which words repeat. My conscience hath a thousand several tongues, and every tongue brings in several a tale, and every tale condemns me for a villain. Which words were repeated? Notice the repetition of words at the start of each clause. My conscience hath a thousand several tongues, and every tongue brings in several a tale, and every tale condemns me for a villain. And this rhetorical device helps Shakespeare deepen the expression of the character's internal turmoil, as each repetition builds upon the previous one to underscore the overwhelming sense of guilt and self-condemnation the character experiences. It's a powerful use of language that adds layers of meaning. By using anadiplosis, authors and speakers are able to engage an audience and conceptually connect clauses through the repetition of a word or a phrase. However, that repetition is not merely a reinforcement of a concept. The repetition actually shows how ideas are interrelated and forms a springboard to move from one concept to another. Can you notice how Shakespeare does this in our example? The speaker feels like there are all these voices in his head or tongues. These tongues tell tales. So thoughts from these voices are all swirling around in his head and every tale or thought tells him that he's the bad guy. He's explaining the guilt that he's feeling through anadiplosis. What a clever use of language. In your own writing, make sure to use anadiplosis sparingly. A little goes a long way with this device. And with that, we've seen all three rhetorical devices in use in the rhetorical kingdom. Nice work today. This week, you'll be exploring each rhetorical device that we've studied today through reading several very famous speeches. You'll develop a personal response to each speech and end the week by applying what you've learned. You'll practice using these rhetorical devices. I know you're going to create something impressive. Learning to recognize these rhetorical devices will enable you to explore the power of words. If you can learn them and implement them into your own writing, your power of communication will only grow. Our journey through the rhetorical kingdom is coming to an end. You, however, shall continue to explore the incredible world of rhetoric. As you discover new ideas and memorable words, look for the impact of language, the power of rhetorical devices, and remember to always be clever.